We have a sense of what Nazi policy entailed from the rise of Hitler in 1933 until the outbreak of World War II in 1939. But let's dig a little deeper and ask how much the average German really knew about the inner workings of Nazi racial ideology. It's no exaggeration to say that anti-Semitism in those days was widespread, even politically correct, and with such purveyors of propaganda as Joseph Goebbels spouting the party line continuously from every media outlet, it's not surprising that the bulk of the population actually ascribed in one way or another to the ideas being conveyed. Propaganda is, of course, for the masses. But what about the members of the German elite, the political class? If you asked, for example, Jalmar Schacht, head of the Reichsbank and German Minister of Finance, about the Jews, he would mouth all the appropriate anti-Semitic slogans. But if you cornered him, if you pulled him aside, he would likely say something a bit different. If Schacht had any motto, it would be something like, export uber alles, export above all. We must export our products so that Germany can be strong again economically. Confidentially, he would tell you, anti-Semitism is bad for business. Will people abroad really want to buy our Volkswagens if they perceive us as vicious racists? We therefore need to restrain anti-Semitic policies. Things need to get normalized. We need to institutionalize the Nazi revolution. Schacht looked at German society in those days and saw two destabilizing elements, the Hitler Youth and the notorious stormtroopers, the SA. Young hoodlums like that worried him the most. Historians have pointed out that almost every revolution down through history is followed by a clash between two camps. Some want to institutionalize the revolution. Others want to radicalize it, keep it going. Institutionalization versus radicalization. The Nazi revolution was a perfect case in point. After Hitler rose to power in 1933, one of the early measures undertaken involved an anti-Jewish boycott, which certainly pleased the radicals. This was a general boycott of Jewish shops and enterprises and professionals. Uniformed Nazi pickets appeared in front of Jewish shops, attacked their clients, and wrote anti-Semitic slogans on their windows. In response, Robert Welch, the editor-in-chief of a respected Zionist newspaper in Berlin, made an impassioned plea for inner fortitude and renewed Jewish pride. In his essay, Wear It With Pride, The Yellow Badge, he wrote, The 1st of April, 1933, will remain an important date in the history of German Jewry. Indeed, in the entire history of the Jewish people. The events of that day have aspects that are not only political and economic, but moral and spiritual as well. Today, the Jews cannot speak except as Jews. Anything else is utterly senseless. Gone is the fatal misapprehension of many Jews that Jewish interests can be pressed under some cover. On April 1st, the German Jews learned a lesson which penetrates far more deeply than even their embittered and now triumphant opponents could assume. We live in a new period. The national revolution of the German people is a signal that is visible from afar, indicating that the world of our previous concepts has collapsed. That may be painful for many, but in this world, only those 
will be able to survive, who are able to look reality in the eye. It is for us to see how the Jews will react. April 1st, 1933 can become the day of Jewish awakening and Jewish rebirth if the Jews will it. If the Jews are mature and have greatness in them. If the Jews are not as they are represented to be by their opponents. The Jews under attack must learn to acknowledge themselves. Even if we stand shattered by the events of these days, we must not lose heart and must examine the situation without any attempt to deceive ourselves. One would like to recommend in these days that the document that stood at the cradle of Zionism Theodor Herzl's The Jewish State be distributed in hundreds of thousands of copies among Jews and non-Jews. They accuse us today of treason against the German people. The National Socialist Press calls us the enemy of the nation and leaves us defenseless. It is not true that the Jews betrayed Germany. If they betrayed anyone, it was themselves, the Jews, because the Jew did not display his Judaism with pride. Because he tried to avoid the Jewish issue, he must bear part of the blame for the degradation of the Jews. The Jew who denies his Judaism is no better a citizen than his fellow who avoids it openly. It is shameful to be a renegade. But as long as the world around us rewarded it, it appeared an advantage. Now, even that is no longer an advantage. The Jew is marked as a Jew. He gets the yellow badge. A powerful symbol is to be found in the fact that the boycott leadership gave orders that a sign with a yellow badge on a black background was to be pasted on the boycott and shops. This regulation is intended as a brand, a sign of contempt. We will take it up and make of it a badge of honor. Many Jews suffered a crushing experience on Saturday. Suddenly, they were revealed as Jews, not as a manner of inner avowal, not in loyalty to their own community, not in pride in a great past and great achievements, but by the impress of a red placard with a yellow patch. The patrols moved from house to house stuck their placards on shops and signboards, daubed the windows, and for 24 hours the German Jews were exhibited in stocks, so to speak. In addition to other signs and inscriptions, one often saw windows bearing a large Magen David, the shield of David, the king. It was intended as dishonor. Jews take it up, the shield of David, and wear it with pride. Welch's essay basically amounted to an acknowledgement that those days represented the end of the long process of Jewish emancipation. From now on, Jews would have to be content to live as a minority in a racist state. Is there any urgency here that Jews should perhaps think about leaving Germany? Of course not. Germany was their home, and in Germany they would remain. After all, the boycott lasted only a single day, so as not to alarm conservatives like Schacht. Welch's words, as we read them today, are haunting, especially 
since there was no way he could have foreseen the radical direction the Nazi revolution would ultimately take. And there were plenty of radicals among the Nazis. Holocaust scholar Yehuda Bauer writes, the extremists were Goebbels, Julius Streicher, publisher of the pornographically anti-Semitic weekly Der Stürmer, and others. These viewed the anti-Jewish boycott of April 1st, 1933 as an opportunity to rid the German economy of the Jews altogether. Bauer continues, pressure from the party rank and file and from the SA, especially to go beyond these legal restrictions, was resisted on several grounds. First, the conservatives were opposed, especially those like Yalmar Schacht, the minister responsible for the restoration of the German economy. To them, any such action was likely to disrupt economic recovery. Schacht and others like him opposed drastic anti-Jewish actions because Jews were considered an important middle-class element in Germany and a powerful force abroad. In 1935, ominous signs appeared. The increasingly violent hate articles appearing in Julius Streicher's Der Stürmer were echoed in Goebbels' Der Angriff, the attack, in translation. The exclusion of Jews from German life altogether was demanded. Hitler's response involves taking the route of least resistance. Placate everybody. What followed were the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, a devastating series of anti-Jewish laws and regulations that most people simply read and weep. But once we understand that a, Germany had been undergoing a revolution, and B, the political elites were caught up in a conflict between institutionalizers and radicals. The Nuremberg Laws come into focus in a new way. Hitler was simply trying to please both sides of his political spectrum. One of the laws had to do with the so-called protection of German blood and honor. Jewish men, were not to contaminate German women. Paragraph one declares, marriages between Jews and state members of German or cognate blood are forbidden. Paragraph two adds, extramarital relations between Jews and state members of German or cognate blood are prohibited. Next we read, Jews must not engage female domestic help in their household among state members of German or cognate blood who are under 45 years of age. These regulations were sure to please the radicals. They were followed by this, the display of the Reich and national flag and the showing of the national colors by Jews is prohibited. Jews were no longer part of the German nation. They had been effectively excommunicated, but they were not stateless either. The very next sentence states, however, the display of the Jewish colors is permitted to them. The exercise of this right is placed under the protection of the state. That provision was designed to placate the more conservative faction, the institutionalizers. Still, the Jews were effectively deprived of German citizenship and also of political rights. As we read, a Reich citizen is only the state member who is of German or cognate blood and who shows through his conduct that he is both desirous and fit to serve in faith the German people and Reich. The Reich citizen is the only holder of full political rights in accordance with the provisions of the laws. In a speech before the Reichstag, Hitler outlined the ideological objectives of the Nuremberg Laws, saying, this law is an attempt to find a legislative solution to the Jewish problem. In the event that this attempt fails, it will be necessary to transfer the problem by law to the National Socialist Party for a final solution.
for the Nazis, of course, everything had to be done by law. In Hitler's mind, the anti-Jewish agitation elsewhere in Europe and across the centuries was useless because it was technically unlawful. The National Socialists would make murder legal. Bear in mind, Hitler the politician cleverly avoids explaining what his final solution would involve. He certainly knows in advance that this attempt, that is the Nuremberg Laws, would fail. So the problem would be transferred to the Nazi party, operating outside the normal legal framework. In the meantime, Hitler was content to give a crumb to the radicals and a crumb to the institutionalizers, basically sitting on the fence. There was one more looming question addressed by the Nuremberg Laws. Who is a Jew? We read, a Jew is anyone who is descended from at least three grandparents who are racially full Jews. A Jew is also one who is descended from two full Jewish parents if A, he belonged to the Jewish religious community at the time this law was issued, or joined the community later, B, he was married to a Jewish person at the time the law was issued, or married one subsequently, C, that he's the offspring of a marriage with a Jew in the sense of Section 1, which was contracted after the law for the protection of German blood and honor became effective, D, he is the offspring of an extramarital relationship with a Jew according to Section 1 and will be born out of wedlock after July 31st, 1936. It's bureaucratic gobbledygook. And notice that the law designates as Jews people involved in the Jewish religious community. But wasn't Jewishness now to be defined as racial, not religious? We might ask, how did Jews define who is a Jew? It's pretty simple. Anyone who has a Jewish mother. That's it. But this law defines a Jew as anyone who is descended from three Jewish grandparents. Well, what if there are only two Jewish grandparents? Such a person is a half-Jew, a Mischling. And Mischlinge were officially protected. In Hungary, many Jews flocked to churches to obtain baptismal certificates, hoping that this would protect them. Many were in for a rude awakening. Sometimes Mischlinger were deported anyway at the whim of the bureaucrat. To bring it all into focus, let's have a look at a hypothetical genealogical chart. A person with two Jewish parents would clearly have at least three Jewish grandparents and be deported to Auschwitz. A Jew who married a German both of whose parents were German, would spawn offspring who were in the Mischling category. Such a person would go off to fight in Hitler's army. Yet the same person might easily have a Jewish mother and be considered Jewish under Jewish law. If this same Mischling were to marry a full-blooded Jew, the Jewish spouse would be protected by virtue of being married to a Mischling. By one estimate, as many as 150,000 soldiers, sailors, and airmen of partial Jewish descent served in Adolf Hitler's forces. Nazi policy turned out to be a Nazi mess. And that's the way it was. <laughs>